Last November, if you recall, uh, Nasser and the Mashtots chair that I hold at Harvard in Armenian Studies, co-sponsored with the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, a show of photographs and documentation of the Armenian monuments of Julfa that have been vandalized in, by the Azerbaijan authorities. Over the last year, Harvard has been under tremendous legal pressure from the Azeri Embassy, which has organized a letter writing campaign, which has affected me too. Um, we're withstanding this pressure, and I want you to know that the Mashtuts chair, as long as I'm in it, is not going to shrink from any controversial subject so long as it has scholarly validity and neither will Harford. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's film and to co-sponsor it. First there was the long darkness, like the tidal wave that you see in a dream of impotent fear. It inundated the great and the small towns of Armenia. Sivas, Kayseri, Van, and a village called Edinjik, where the ancestors of Apotorosyan lived. A spring with carbon crosses, a mulberry tree, the fruit that year was not picked. And in the faraway capital of the empire of Constantinople, an American diplomat protested, but his government took the side of the murderers and still does. Because every voice, Ambassador Morgenthau's, Armin Wegner's, Haji Halil's, was confined in a cell of silence. The destroyers of the living world went on to despoil other towns, to empty other homes, to silence other voices, Jan Karski's, Raphael Lemkins, all over the world, the light tried and tried to shine in the darkness, and the darkness seemed to encompass it. But in defiance of the algebra of cynicism and the machinery of death, the voices were never entirely silenced. The human rights movement, as we know from Peter Balakian's work, began to take shape in part because against the Armenian genocide, American citizens invoked, without the aid of their government, nature's rights and nature's God. And Armenian poets and painters, cinematographers and architects were not silent. They continued to make cathedrals of words and to compose songs in stone never forgetting the vernal earth, celebrating the good smell of bread, and in moral war against slavery and racism, our New World's iteration of genocide, here too, Dr. Martin Luther King fought, and he fell in battle, and once again we seem to lose the light. Istanbul, mosques, and birds wheeling in the sun, and the smell and sound of cafes and fish restaurants and the breezes from the sea. In the very imperial metropolis, where the very evil was first conceived, today, the best and the most articulate voices of the great and ill-served Turkish nation, Nazim Hikmet's people, are speaking up. And not only Taner Akcham and Orhan Pamuk, but now my own students of Armenian at Harvard who outnumber those of Armenian descent in studying Armenian. Shukru Ilajak, Murat Jankara. We're here tonight to honor and remember a Jewish American whose heroic work is celebrated in a film by an Armenian American and the Armenian chair at Harvard has the privilege to co-sponsor this event. 
It could be a bitter occasion. The Armenian genocide continues to be denied, and anti-Semitism is very much alive. And in Darfur, and in Somalia, who can speak of human rights? But this is no ordinary night. The sparks of extinguished lives, as it turns out, do kindle a fire, and the fire cannot be encompassed by darkness. When Dr. King and Hrant Dink died, crowds gathered, and they gathered to mourn in a life that for many of us sometimes feels too long. Too much of what we've seen are protest marches or memorial throngs. But in the small hours of yesterday, Wednesday morning, there was something else, a different kind of throng, a celebration on Harvard Square, throughout Cambridge, across the nation, and over all the world. It reminded one that it is too soon to abandon the fight, to abandon the light now. So let the time come when the celebrations will erupt in Istanbul and Ankara, in Samsun and Adana, that glasses of Raki will be poured, that celebrations will come as only Anatolians know how, on the night when the Turkish Republic, following the leadership of the United States, elects its first Armenian president. Is Minchev ein Vahavorka? Sharuna Genk Makarenk, Chemoranank, Mishteli Gurknek, Vormenk Gurnank. Till that moment comes, let's continue to fight and not forget and say again, as we know so well how to say, yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you, James. That was great. Uh, give me one moment while I reconfigure everything for the video and turn out the lights. And after the video, uh, we will ask Apo to say a few words. And I'm sure he will gladly entertain your, your questions and, and observations. So thank you, and uh, don't leave your seats. <coughs> Then she checked me out through Mark. <laughs> and I got an okay. <laughs> so that was the beginning of the battle. Outside of that, my deep thanks and honor, Dr. James Russell, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you for being here, Pam. Good to see you. We had a great time in. Athens. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored to have uh, one of the ideals, heroes among us, I call him hero, Mr. Tarsi, Andrew Tarsi. Oh. We're proud of you. Oh, I, I'm, I'm very proud that we have Turkish friends among us. And one of them is Professor Oktay Öze from Bilkent University. Welcome, Oktay. I'm uh, very proud that I had the opportunity to, to share this film and work together with our Armenian composer, Hai Boyajian, he's among us. Hai. As you saw, his music was fabulous. And the last person uh, that I'd like to thank after 12, 14 hours of a day of work, 
in my office on the film, then the result would be like 30 seconds, and my other half, her name is Jennifer, Jennifer Dawson. She, she gave me that uh, push that things were great. She not step from the beginning. Uh, I have a lot to say, but it's better if you ask me the questions, except I just want to make a few remarks with the recent events that's happening. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm very proud of the choice that our country made. And uh, our elect president, he told to the nation that a 106 years old black woman did vote for him. That lady, which she never saw when she was younger, there was no telephones, no airplanes, no cars. And as a woman, she didn't have the right to vote or to sit in a bus uh, in a proper place where she wanted. She did all that, a great achievement. I want to compare that lady with one of my witnesses that I made last year, the film was called Voices. She was, her name was Yersapet Iragosia. She lived in North Andover. She was 107 years old. She witnessed the genocide. She was 15 years old during the genocide. I do hope that our elect president is honest to his words and promises and won't be like the other past presidents which they promised but they never fulfilled their promises. He promised that he will recognize the Armenian genocide for the sake of one and a half million people. Then Miss, Mrs. Giragos, Giragosia will be happy in her grave. That's my wish. Uh, outside of that, I can talk forever, so it's better if you have questions. Please. Yes? No question. I have a question. Could, yes, please. Could you talk about the showing of the film, the premiere of the film that took place in Athens recently? It was an amazing event. You have to realize, you saw the survivors, the archival photographs of those orphans that they were transported from Turkey to Greece. The number was 1,650,000 of them. 1,650,000. The Greek government in that time was 4 to 5 million. So it was like one-fifth of the population grew. The amazing part, those people, the immigrants that they came from Turkey, they built everything themselves. Everything was done, organized, put together by the immigrants. They were all very highly skilled, very business-minded people. So when Henry Morgenthau got that huge money, and he was almost refused, when he went to the meeting, the bank says, there's no way, we're not giving you anything, there's nothing to promise. He convinced them. Within an hour, they all gave that money to him. 
And this people, they built their own roads, they built their own homes, they built their own <coughs> schools. I did go and visit those homes. Uh, part of them are in the Armenian section of Athens. There's a street in Greek written, Morgenthau. Uh, they are very proud with their history. We went, the first night we went to the Morgenthau school, which he donated that with his own money. He was such a generous person. He didn't take money from the uh, uh, United Nations. He didn't he refused to take money. He spent his own money, plus extra. And that school was built with his donation in the Armenian section of the city. Uh, and it was like living the old days. For me, it was like visiting Istanbul. It, it was nothing was perfect. Nothing was clean. Nothing was just up to the par. But the film didn't work well. The sound system was terrible. Tonight we had a little bit of glitch. Please forgive us. Uh, but you know what? Because they had Greek subtitles of the film, they could read it. Even they couldn't hear it, they could read it. It was, there was no sitting space. People were standing all the way to the doors. The hallways was full of people. This is the first night now. It was not a planned thing. And uh, when, the finish, when the film was over, I was bombarded with three, four languages. People were coming to me. I didn't know whether to speak Greek, because I speak Greek a bit, or Turkish, or Armenian, or English. They were, they were the children and the grandchildren of the survivors. It was touching history. I was living history. And the same thing happened the following day. It was, the place was packed. We had some minor uh, technical, nothing major, minor. But when I had, uh, you know, I, I was trying to put some Greek words into my speech. I can remember the word. Oh, they were so helpful. <laughs> they loved giving me the Greek words. It was the reunion. People that I never met before, they were like brothers and sisters, hugging and kissing. It was such a warm, warm welcome, so sincere. And the most touching part for me was my friends. Uh, when I do my immigration installation, uh, the visitors are encouraged to write their experience as an immigrant or a migrant. And once a 12-year-old girl in New Hampshire wrote exactly how an immigrant feels. She said, in so short sentence, it hurts, I miss my friends. And for me, the most valuable part of this event in Athens was my friends. My friends, they came all the way from Turkey. I couldn't go back to Turkey. I believe I will go to jail. But they came. They were not responding to my emails. They were not responding to my newsletters. They were not responding to my essays. I knew why. But I, I didn't know until they came and told me that they were afraid of the government. What we have is such a treasure to be able to speak up, to be able to share our 
minds, our souls, in a civilized way, whether we agree or disagree, that's okay. We don't have to kill each other. We don't have to imprison each other. What government has the right to imprison an author, a writer? If some of you were in my last showing in here when I showed the voices, Raghav Zarakolu was my guest in that evening. He is facing jail sentence. You know what's his guilt? He translated a book from a British Armenian author that mentions Armenian genocide in the book. He's facing jail sentence. In the meantime, I just received an email from him. His editor of his uh, printing company is in jail now. That is democracy in Turkey. So many young men, so many intellectuals are facing jail sentences, oppression. And that's just only for the intellectual. I mean, when it comes to minorities, it's a whole different story that I can go on forever. So, thanks for asking me. Yep. Yes, yes, please. What difficulties are you facing in trying to get this uh, film story on national television? How many times? Well, uh, to begin with, to really to make a good movie, it takes a lot more than what I have. So, even this movie, uh, it could be in, in a good quality. Uh, still, it's not in the part that it should be. I mean, I know what's missing. I know what it takes. It can be done, but it takes money. Uh, outside of that, there is, there is interested uh, people one of them is in Greece, in Athens, uh, that they want to distribute the film in Greece. I'm grateful for that. Uh, I, I couldn't go to the uh, international film market, which is right now in LA. They, I have been told that I should be there, then there's 200 vendors that might be interested, but it's okay. You know, I, I'm not after the business. I'm not doing this for money. It is, however, for sale in the bookstore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we would encourage you to support Apo. That helps. That course. helps, but I'm not doing for it. Yes, ma'am. Um, where did you get the footage of the soldiers um, being killed? Because that's what the movie is about. The soldiers Thirteen hours of work. Tracking it down. Tracking it down, getting permissions, getting. Uh, what, was the, what, was the, uh, what was the source that you read that you realized it existed, first of all? Oh, we, we just search. I mean, it's, it's constant search. Research is everything. You know, you're a scholar yourself. You know what it takes. Uh, it is a lot of research, a lot of research. The film was done in one week, the skeleton of the film. I can do that. But to create the film, putting the muscles and the functions of those muscles, that's why it takes a long time. The actual footage of the soldiers, was that in Germany? Did you find that? Oh, that was from World War One. Yes, yeah. no, but where? Where did it exist? Uh, I have those in my notes, but I don't have all specific, every clip of exactly the location of the war where it was happening. But I have it on my credits. It, it says the origination of the credits. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, this is really a, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, introduction with the Morgenthau family. You mentioned the Greeks and the, of course, the Armenians, but you don't say anything about the Assyrians. Is I, that because the Morgenthau records do not deal with No, the no, I, I, I put that in my own essay, my uh, 
communication no, in my speeches. My I always mention in in total in in uh, in total. Of course, numbers are debatable, uh, but in total, Armenians supposed to be uh, one and a half million, and the Greeks and the Syrians supposed to be another million. So that goes half and half with the Greeks and Arme and, and the Assyrians, which is which is a fact, a historical fact. It's just that not too many scholars has really uh, work, put enough uh, research on those subjects yet. But they are working. Uh, there is a great amount of Greek historians are researching and trying to bring the facts that there was a, a, a huge amount of Greek genocide, uh, which is covered up under the war uh, parenthesis. In reality, it was just the same as happened to Armenians. Uh, it started in 1916 and 17, where uh, it started uh, part of it in the Black Sea, where uh, the men were uh, put together, tied up their hands together. They did the same thing to Armenians put them on a boat and went to the Black Sea and drowned them. And women and children were just uh, pushed all the way to uh, the interior and they were raped, murdered and uh, starved to death. Same story. The same uh, story was just... And, you know, there is a, a great connection between uh, the Ottoman government and the uh, the Germans' influence on that. Not only that, uh, 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 you might know that Raphael Lenkin himself, which he was the person that uh, coined the name genocide, he was uh, he was witnessing the court case of Talat Pasha, where he was murdered in. Uh, Berlin, and uh, uh, Tehlerian was the uh, murderer, and he was forgiven when he explained what happened to his family. And uh, Raphael Lemkin was in the crowd listening, first time being exposed to the Armenian genocide. Then that intrigued him to look more into the Armenian genocide and becoming a lawyer himself, getting into the law, then eventually his own family was wiped out. Yes, in the back. Yes. Well, uh, who doesn't know her, I think? Uh, yes. Uh, He is and was probably one of the most outspoken, most, one of the most liberal minded, down to earth person. He, he, he spoke from his heart with an intellect. He believed that the change couldn't be from the top, it had to be from the bottom from the roots and he saw he saw he had a vision he was inspirational and he still is if uh, if I had to compare him I would compare him to Martin Luther King he was such a dedicated waste talent. But people like that gives inspirations to others, to humanitarians, people which they don't think themselves first. If you want to give, give. Don't expect. Just give. Yes, sir. Uh, I was talking about the district attorney made their remark, which I think is quite important to, to, to comment on. And the remark was that the 
the recognition of uh, the Armenian genocide by government is such imposed from the top. Is that going to serve any purpose? It should come from the Turkish people. Now there are many, many voices in the Turkish newspapers, Asha, Europe, and so on. What right hand, but they put their genocide in quotation marks, but they give all the details that define what the genocide is. Then, recognizing that the uh, textbooks published by the Turkish government, they just describe something, an event which is insanely you know, wrong, saying that uh, the Armenians targeted the Russians, and some they did. I mean, in the Eastern Front, of course they did. They were the Russian subjects. Now, the thing is, I agree with you. I agree with you. This gentleman was saying that, which is a fact, that uh, the Turkish government, historically, the date will be 1930, by the Atatürk regime, changed everything. History was rewritten. The Turkish writing, which was Arabic, converted into Turkish, which is Latin in alphabet. So nobody in Turkey, today's generation, can read the past. So they don't know their history, even though they have history. If they go to archives, there is history. It shows what happened. There is uh, a, a military uh, archival uh, in Istanbul in 1918-1919, where all this uh, generals and government people uh, from the coup uh, were involved in, in the leading to the Armenian genocide. But because there's no mention of that, the Turkish government has a different history written by the Turkish government. So, uh, the, the, uh, today's generation, they're, they're waffled. They, they just don't know whether the past is true, is it their ancestors were murderers, or is it, is it something an Armenian diaspora is creating this propaganda? Uh, it, it, is, it is a dilemma for the Turkish uh, new generation which they are questioning. They are questioning, which is great. Uh, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, if there is smoke, there is fire. So, there is uh, smoke that the question is in their mind. But not all of them, of course, and there is far-right extremists that they just want to kill. And they just killed uh, Hrant Dink. Just because of that, he spoke up. All right, and, uh, and the government itself has inner chambers. So military is the final speaker. Turkey is not run by the government. There's no such a thing as government in Turkey. All right, it's just the facade. It's the military that tells how to run the country. And all right. I don't want to go too far for that, but, you know, uh, I believe it comes to ethics. Ethics from every society, that, that comes as, as a stumbling block. Uh, you might say, why? Because we compromise. If our government compromises, to get along with the Turkish government so we can have our bases, our businesses, or whatever other uh, reasons. That's compromise. That's compromise against humanity. That's compromise against human rights. That's compromise and cover-up to genocide or any other harm to humanity. I think 
our governments should be more honest, more caring about humanity, not caring about what will be the benefit of the country. Uh, that's, that's my personal view. If I went too far, for it. sorry. <laughs> Apo, thank you so much. Professor Russell, thank you so much. Let me mention that uh, Dr. Steiner's article, uh, paper that was given also recently in Athens at the same event that Apo mentioned, Healing and Reconciliation for All Peoples of Asia Minor and Istanbul. I have copies available. She asked me to make it available to you. If you are interested in it, I will put uh, a number of them out on the front desk, and if we run out, I'll make more, okay? So, there are refreshments. Uh, the bookstore is open. Oppo's video is available. We invite you to join us. And I thank you for coming tonight. Just, just one more thing, please. I have a guest book. So, whoever wants to write something in that book, that will be for my grandson and my granddaughter. So, they know that instead of going for fishing, I've been doing